This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We welcome you to our worship this morning online and are glad that you're joining us here at First Presbyterian Church in Granbury. We hope that uh, you'll come visit us here in the sanctuary one of these days. But we are glad that you're here and we encourage you to let us know you're here. Make a comment there at YouTube or Facebook and let us know that you're watching this morning. This is the culmination of our stewardship season this morning, although stewardship is a way of life. It's something that we do year-round, but this is our consecration Sunday. Normally, we have one big service and everybody's here in the sanctuary. We bring our pledges forward and, and it's a very celebratory time together. And afterwards, we go have a big meal across the street. We can't do all that this year. Hopefully you have received your stewardship packet from our stewardship chair, Jack Gilmore, and a follow-up letter from me. We hope that uh, you will return your estimate of giving cards so that we may begin work on next year's budget. We are very appreciative of the work and support that you give to our church and to the ministry that we perform here and are grateful for that. This morning, as uh, we worship, we remind you that uh, this is Consecration Sunday and hope that you'll, you'll think in those terms as we gather together. We have called a congregational meeting for Sunday, December 6th to be conducted via email for the purpose of acting on the nominating committee report that Stephanie Mosley be elected as our admin chair for the class of 2022. Uh, you'll see more details about that, some more information about Stephanie and what she brings to the task, but also more information about how we will conduct the vote. So watch for that if you would please. Remind you that our offices will be closed Thursday and Friday this week for the Thanksgiving holiday, and there will be nobody at the office. A couple of folks to keep in mind in our prayers this week that have been hospitalized. Ruth Gump had hip replacement surgery doing well. She is home, and uh, if she recuperates as quickly as she did the last time she had surgery, she'll be back amongst us in no time flat. Peggy Losher was taken to Medical Cities in Dallas, uh, had some correspondence with her this morning. She's feeling much better, coming out of ICU, and hopes to be home on Saturday of this week, but we do keep both those folks in mind following medical procedures and surgery this past week. If you'd like to give a poinsettia uh, to the church for our Advent and Christmas season, either in honor of or in memory of someone, please note that there will be forms in the Bridge newsletter. They are available online. The flowers are $12.50 apiece. You may fill out the form there or give Shanna a call in the church office and she'll help you with that. Another note, you know that we've been having and holding in-person worship for the last handful of weeks. The session at its meeting Tuesday night regretfully decided that we needed to suspend in-person worship as our numbers rise about us as we move into the holiday season. So in-person worship is suspended until the 17th of January, which gets us through Thanksgiving, through Christmas, and two weeks beyond so that we'll know what the numbers are doing at that time. We regret having to do that, but think it's the wise decision for the health and safety of everyone in our worshiping community. There's a letter that will come as an email blast to everyone if you've not received that already, and there'll be notices on our website and uh, through the church office. So please do make note of that. We are suspending in-person worship following this Sunday until the 17th of January. Our worship begins with the organ prelude, with the piano prelude. We invite you in silence to prepare yourselves to enter into the presence of God.
Let us stand and continue our worship using the words in the call to worship as written in your bulletin. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to God. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Let us gather to worship God in thanksgiving. Let us now sing together hymn 716, God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. God whose giving knows no ending is the giver of forgiveness and the giver of grace. Let us, in thanksgiving for those gifts, confess our sin before God that we may know the grace of Jesus Christ and live gracefully together. Please join me in the prayer of confession. God of mercy, who has compassion for the lost and the least, in disbelief and denial we ask, when did we see you among us? We should have seen you in the stranger on the sidewalk whom we crossed the street to avoid, or in the neighbor at the nursing home whom we left alone in her loneliness. We should have seen you in the man begging for work or a warm meal, and the woman struggling to overcome addiction, and the child seeking refuge from the terrors of violence. But instead, we turned away. Forgive us, Lord. Break our hearts for what breaks yours, and give us courage and compassion to respond to the lost and the least. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. 
If a person is in Christ, they become a new creation altogether. Behold, the past is finished and it is gone. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel in the waters of our baptism and in the grace of Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. Peace may be found in using our gifts in service to the lost and the least. May the peace of Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come before you today longing to hear your word, longing to hear your voice, longing to hear your spirit. Today, empty our thoughts of everything but you, that we might experience anew the reality of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our first reading today is Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. Listen for the word of the Lord. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, and for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power? God put forth this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now children, gather around your televisions or your iPads. Miss Nancy has a word for you. Hey, Waco. Hey, Mana. What's in the cup? 14 cents. 14 cents. And some hairs from Bunky. <laughs> 14 cents and some hairs from Bunky. Uh -huh. Why? It's all that I have that is precious. Aww. What are you going to do with it? I'm sending it to my friend Jackie Gilmore. Jack Gilmore? Uh huh. From church? Uh huh. Oh, why? Because it's stewardship. Oh, yeah, it is. It, it's stewardship Sunday, and we're getting ready to give a portion of what we owe what we own to the church. That's right. And this is all I got. 14 cents on bunky hairs. Uh, okay. In a solo cup. That's right. Alrighty. And how are you going to send them? Watch. Okay. Oh. Okay. There it goes. There it goes. Wow. Out the door. And out the door. It's going. It's going. All the way out the door. Huh. And how far is it going? All the way to Jackie Gilmore's house. All the way to Jack Gilmore's house? Yes. That's across town? Yes. At least 15 miles. Uh-huh. <laughs> Do you have that much ribbon? Yes. 15 miles of ribbon? Yes. Where did you get it? eBay. How did you pay for it? PayPal. <laughs> I 
Honey, you don't have to do that. That is precious. I need to send it. Yes, but you don't have to send it in a solo cup on, on white ribbon. I don't know. You could put it in an envelope and take it to church. Oh. Or you could put it in an envelope and you could take it to the office. Oh. Or there are other ways to pay the church online. Oh. You spend a lot of money on white ribbon and a solo cup and 14 cents and 14 cents, and donkey hairs, and bunky hairs. This is the truth. There's a lot of ways to give to the church, a lot of ways. This is probably not the best one. I can't wait to see Jack Gilmore getting bunky hairs and 14 cents at his house, but the truth is, thank you, Waco. You gave from your heart. That's what the church needs. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. My pal Waco called and let me know that he had something for me this Sunday. He's, uh, he's isolated now because of the COVID. So we rigged up a pulley between his house and our house. Let's see what Waco has got. Let's see. Wow. Looks like 14 cents, and uh, and apparently the fur off Bunky's back. I hope, I hope Waco asked before you took. Thank you very much, Waco and Bunky, for your 2021 pledge. The Gospel reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter, the 31st through the 46 verses. It's titled, A Judgment of the Nations. It is a reminder of the seriousness with which we are to take the command to care for one another to be stewards of one another, to be cognizant of those that are least and lost among us. Listen to these chapters, these verses from Matthew's Gospel. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, there he will sit on the throne of his glory all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in person, in prison, and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, 
when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous have eternal life. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Henry Nouwen the noted Jesuit theologian, author, speaker, and professor, died unexpectedly several years ago from a heart attack. He left behind a remarkable collection of writings about spirituality, about discipleship, about how it is that we find a nurture in the faith. Some years before his death, Nowen left the Harvard Divinity School to join the staff at Daybreak, a residential community for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. He went from working with the best and the brightest and sharing a spotlight of notoriety to laboring almost invisibly with a group of individuals that most of the world would like to forget altogether. From teaching and lecturing to full auditoriums, from spending, spending hours in research so that he could sit behind the word processor and bang out a new book for his companions and his peers, from interviews with, with prominent journals and magazines, from all that he went to waking others, feeding, bathing, and changing their clothing. He spent his days tending to the emotional and the physical and the spiritual needs of those that he had only known by reputation before. In his book titled In the Name of Jesus, Nowen shared his thinking about why he did what he did. Listen to his words. He wrote, most of my past life has been built around the idea that my value depends on what I do. I made it through grade school, high school, university, I earned degrees and awards, and I made a career for myself. Yes, with many others, I fought my way up to the lonely top of a little success, a little popularity, a little power. But as I sit here by the slow and heavy breathing Adam, a resident at daybreak. I start seeing how violent that journey actually was. So filled with the desire to be better than others, so marked by rivalry and competition, so pervaded with compulsions and obsessions, and so spotted with moments of su suspicion, jealousy, and revenge. Henry Nowen learned an awful lot about himself and about the gifts of his life by learning to assist others in the living of their lives. He discovered that one does not come to know Christ by climbing down and away from those that Christ himself identifies with in the gospel. He began to understand that perhaps we cannot know Christ. We cannot know the Christ of our faith without also knowing those who are weak, who are disenfranchised, who are poor, who are hungry, who are captive, who are forgotten. He came to realize that we find Christ 
in the faces of those who cry out for Christ's presence. In the faces of those who cry out for Christ's presence. Finding Christ is now in noted requires a different task. It requires something that's most foreign to almost all of us. It requires downward mobility. Downward mobility. From climbing up the ladder of a little success, now and realized his faith in learning to descend the ladder instead. He embraced the thinking of Benjamin Roberts, who wrote the poor are the favored ones. They are not called up. The great ones are called down. He began to examine his faith from a different perspective, asking if he himself was willing to be called down. The question placed his life in a different context. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing to wear. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. The inheritance of the kingdom is found in doing exactly this. Exactly this. Christ is discovered in the very act of caring for other members of Christ's family. And that's how he refers to them in this passage. The least of these who are members of my family. The least of these who are members of my family, he says. And those listening to his words were dumbfounded by what he said. When? When, when, when did we do that? When did we do that? I think I've most likely shared this remembrance from this pulpit at some time or another. So I apologize if it's a rerun, but I hope you'll abide with me as I share it once more. Because I have a hard time this time of year as we move into Thanksgiving and as we dedicate our gifts and our offerings to God in stewardship of what we have been gifted with, I have a hard time not remembering this occasion in my life. Almost 30 years ago now, when my kids were young and little, and when Rhonda and I were younger and littler, we went together past downtown Phoenix on the Wednesday evening before Thanksgiving to participate in a prayer vigil for homeless women and men who died on the streets of Phoenix that year. We went at the invitation of a good friend who worked closely with the issue of homelessness and who knew many of these people well because of her work with them. She cared deeply about their plight and she invited us to come so that we might see from a different perspective exactly what the homeless problem was and who these people that we, we refer to simply as the homeless really are. I was grateful for the invitation, but I've got to admit I was fairly uncomfortable in my surroundings that evening. Only a small group gathered in that potter's field, a small portion of land given by Maricopa County to bury those folks, those homeless souls who had no place else to go, even in death. There were maybe 80 or 90 of us all together that gathered there that evening. Most of them were homeless themselves. 
80 or 90 folks out of what at that time was a metropolitan area of about 2 million people. Slowly, methodically, as our candles began to burn in the evening breeze and got shorter and shorter, we heard the names read of 67 men and women who had died on the streets of Phoenix that year. And mixed between the names and the ages of those that were known were reminders of John Doe, age unknown, Jane Doe, age unknown. I couldn't that night, and I still can't imagine, dying on the streets and having no one know my name, no one to know it at all. I felt, as I stood there, that I had missed an opportunity to know the Christ, the Christ of our faith. But we keep our distance. I don't know, maybe it is the face of Christ that we really seek to avoid. But that year, we tried to make a contact. I tried to understand. A few days prior to Thanksgiving, a group of us traveled down near Tent City, where the city had given folks ropes and blue tarps on a dirt plot. And there was just tent after tent after tent made of those blue tarps for folks to stay in in the midst of downtown Phoenix. But we went down and served meals at St. Vincent de Paul's for more than two hours, scooped food as quickly as I could. Over 3,000 meals we served to homeless and forgotten people. And as I dropped yet another spoonful of dry Thanksgiving dressing on yet another tray and looked into the eyes of yet another nameless hungry stranger. I got emotional. And a couple of days later, we returned early in the morning to St. Mary's Food Bank to serve breakfast to about 500 folks that gathered outside for something to eat in the early morning air. But in both those occasions, every now and then, I did think that I saw the face of Christ in the faces of those that we served, every now and then. And I did learn that if we look deep enough, if we peer deeply enough into those in need, that we will find that Christ is there. The Sunday paper came and I cut out the editorial and held on to it. The editorial from the editorial department of the Phoenix Gazette. It was titled, A Thanksgiving Message. This is what it said. The city of Phoenix delivered its Thanksgiving message to the homeless a few days early this year. Get lost. Feed yourselves. Thanksgiving, the day when those of us who can afford much reflect on their blessings and thank God, when those with plenty to share with others who have less gladly do so because it is the right thing to do, except, of course, in Phoenix. Here the city has ordered St. Mary's Food Bank to stop serving breakfast to more than 500 people. It's become unpopular, you see. St. Mary's mission is to feed the hungry. That's why they exist. Yet in response to neighbors' complaints, the city has closed the operation down effective Tuesday. The editorial continued. The philosopher Rousseau might recognize the situation. He saw it in pre-revolutionary France, an era when Marie Antoinette 
was to have said of the poor, let them eat cake. Rousseau declared at the time that the more humanity owed the poor man, the more society denies him. Every door is shut against him. If he obtains justice, it is with greater difficulty than others obtain favors. End of the editorial. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was sick. I was in prison. I was the Christ, and you recognized me, and you helped me. Or did we? Or will we? This is our Stewardship Sunday, Consecration Sunday. When does the preacher remind us how very gifted we are by the hand of God? When does he give his spiel about gratitude and the role that gratitude plays in realizing our faith? When does the preacher remind us of our need, our need to give to God? That giving of our gifts is an outward expression of our inward faith that enables us to grow in the presence of the Creator. And when does the preacher tell us again about the importance of the biblical tithe and setting aside the first fruits of our labor as an act of trust in the promises of God? And when does he tell us about the need of the church to plan appropriately their budget for the coming year to pay the light bill, to keep pastoral care coming, and to ensure that worship happens and that it happens decently and in order so that God will not only know that we are Christians, but will know that we're Presbyterian Christians. When does the preacher do all that? You've heard those sermons before. Good sermons, all of them. Spot on, I would think. But mostly you know those things. Like the Christmas story and the Easter story every year in the life of the church. You've heard those tales of stewardship. And they are all good to hold close to the heart. But when we put it all together, Stewardship really is and stewardship really becomes a way of living, a way of life. And when we put it all together, then it will be a reminder that what we're really striving for is a stewardship of life itself. A way of living that incorporates gratitude of gifts of the gifts that we've received in faith so that we might find for ourselves how very life-giving those gifts are. And with that knowledge in hand, we can offer what is life-giving to another, to those who are hungry and thirsty and naked and sick and homeless, and strangers, and prisoners, to those. And when we do that, that's when we will learn to practice a stewardship of life, a stewardship of life. That's when we'll learn to see the face of Christ in one another. That's what Christ is calling us to do for the least of these who are members of Christ's family. You 
You see, being stewards of one another is the most life-giving thing that we can do. And surely, it's precisely what it is that Christ calls us to do. Let us now stand and profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed as written in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Wondrous, almighty, perfect, generous, creator God. Today we come before you to thank you. Today this prayer will surround our adoration for you and our thanks to you for the many gifts that you have given to us. Lord, hear our prayers as your people. God, you have given us everything that we have. You've created all of the planets, all of the solar systems, this earth, the sky, the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars, our families, our friends, our churches. You put together your word, Lord, on paper and in person so that we might better understand you, something of you, Lord. You've given us minds with which to learn of you. You've given us hearts with which to feel for one another. You've given us souls that look forward to the day that we will see you again. Lord, we thank you. How is it, Lord, that you spin these planets, that you, that you take this creation of yours and make it work together so perfectly and so abundantly and so amazingly? On the other hand, Lord, how is it that you are so patient with your human creation who often spins out of control and does not follow your prescribed will? Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for all of the second and third and 2900th chances that you give us, Lord, to do your will. We come before you with grateful hearts for your grace. We come before you with wondrous hearts, Lord, that you consider us children. You've called us children. We are your children co-heirs with our brother Jesus Christ. How can that be, Lord? We thank you. We praise you. Lord, we thank you for your patience in this world as you allow things to not go according to your plan, but you keep us here because you love those who do not know you just as much as you love those who do. You know us all. We are all your children, and it is not your will that any of us should perish. So we thank you, Lord, that you are giving us time to help you add to the numbers of our brothers and sisters. Lord, we thank you for life and for love and for hope, for eternal life, for heaven and earth and all of the things that you have given us. We thank you, Lord, for one another. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us differing ideas and, and differing thoughts, and together when we listen that we come up with something better than any of us could have come up with before. Because when we gather, we gather in your name, and we look to you, as the source of all of our guidance. So we do thank you, Lord, for one another. And we thank you, Lord, for those for whom in our midst we are most concerned. We thank you, Lord, for the lives of Ed and Mary, J.D. and Libby, for Wynette and Eloise and Jimmy and Peggy, for Dave and Dee and Donna and Diane, for Kathleen and Stan and C.H. and Ruth. Lord, we thank you that each one of these people and all of us are in your hands. We thank you for all of those that are on our hearts that we did not mention today. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of fellowship, for the gift 
of hills. Lord, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be broken bread and poured out wine for us, to serve as an example, and to bring us back into right relationship with you. Lord, we are grateful. And today as we dedicate our gifts to you, we are so aware that the things for which we are to be grateful far outweigh, even this year, the things for which we are concerned. For nothing could overcome your greatness or your graciousness in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ who came, who gave everything away, who died and rose again so that we could be with you. So, Lord, today, accept our gratitude. Today, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Normally this would be the time when we bring, to bring forward our cards, our pledges, and our gifts for the coming year. We can't do that this year. But let us bring forward to God in these moments of silence as we listen to the offertory. Let us bring forward ourselves, and let us think about what it is that we are grateful for as we consider all that God has given us. Let us pray. Lord, we bring before you today our gifts 
for the coming year, our pledges. May you use those pledges and the gifts that come throughout the year to bless your people and to glorify yourself. May they make a difference, Lord, because they have been given from a cheerful heart. May you bless your people everywhere. And may our gifts reach places we never even knew they would because of your great majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As we conclude our worship today, remember these words, words that are to so many of us very familiar, words that remind us of our obligation to be stewards of one another, because perhaps at some time in our living, all of us are lost in the least, but particularly for those for whom we might help with the gifts that God has entrusted to our care, might we take on a stewardship of their lives and know in it the stewardship of the things God has given us. Something to think about. Now with the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.